Welcome back to the Get Unstuck and On Target podcast. I'm Mike O'Neill with Bench Builders, and we help growing companies, especially manufacturers, improve their people, process, and planning systems so they can scale smarter and faster. Joining me is Glenn Gao. Glenn is the CEO therapist. He was a CEO for 25 years. Glenn now coaches CEOs to perform at their highest level to achieve both success and happiness. The kinds of things that he helps CEOs with is he helps them create clarity to recognize their strengths and weaknesses, understand their blind spots, create structure and team alignment, scale their business effectively, and lastly, thrive as a CEO. Welcome, Glenn. Mike, it's a real joy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'm glad you're part of this because I love, as a starting point, you describe yourself, and it may be that someone other originally coined this as the CEO therapist. Yes, that, that came about because my clients mentioned that much of the time we're working on operations, mm -hmm. but some of the time we're working on the mental game. Mm. And it turns out that I had a coach for 17 years when I was a CEO. And a big part of my learning was the mental game. I didn't realize how important it was, Mike, while I was a CEO until I had that coach. So now I help CEOs understand there is a mental game and that they can improve in that mental game. And that's an important area for them to focus on. And the benefit is the company will perform at a higher level. The individual will often per perform at a higher level. And as I mentioned, they'll usually be happier in their role as a result. How long have you been coaching full-time? Uh, coaching full-time, two years, but I've been coaching for about seven years because after I was a CEO, I went into venture capital Mm. began coaching the CEOs of our portfolio companies. And that's where I discovered that um, this was a, a area of the world I loved, the, the assistance to CEOs, the working with CEOs, the helping them in every way I possibly could. And that's why I've chosen this as my current passion career. Well, my sense is already, you had the forethought early in your tenure as a CEO to engage a coach. You mentioned 17 years yeah. plus venture capitalists, plus you've been doing this. You embrace coaching quite some time back. Coaching, particularly coaches for CEOs. Is that something that you have seen just really explode in the last decade or so? Well, there's an acknowledgement, Mike, with many, many people that there's a reason that the world's greatest athletes have coaches. Hmm. They're already the world's greatest athlete and they bring in a coach. And the reason is they have a mentality that they can become better, that they can improve. It isn't about whether you're good or not today. It's about, do you want to improve? In fact, I'll tell you a little secret. If you take the fortune 500, and you look at those CEOs, they have coaches. You just don't know about them. Mm. They're in the background. They're helping those CEOs overcome their biggest challenges. So it's been around and only recently has it really become obvious to everyone, oh, there's this thing called CEO coaching that could be helpful and once a coach, or sorry, once a CEO determines that they're ready for a coach and they're willing to listen and grow, then the improvements a CEO can see in that be due to that relationship are phenomenal. So that's that's what I see happen. So what you're sharing is it's not that CEO coaches is a new phenomenon, but the awareness of that. And you make an interesting point. If the vast majority, if not all CEOs at the Fortune 500 level have a coach, then it's clear that that could attribute to why they are in the roles that they're in. Exactly. Glenn, exactly. you made an interesting point, And that is when people hear the word coaching, they might make the wrong assumption. You pointed out that if 
professional athletes are already world class, but they also have a coach. They see opportunities that get better. You pointed out that you are working with CEOs that really are very effective who want to be even more effective. Is that a pretty good description? It's exactly right. It's exactly right. So often a CEO knows that they're very skilled in certain areas and they recognize they're not so skilled in others. That's just all of us humans are that way. But they also recognize that uniquely because they're a CEO, they need to be competent at every function in the company. They can't ignore manufacturing. They can't ignore sales. They can't ignore finance or whatever it might be because they don't feel they're good at it. They have to up their game. And part of my job is to help them understand, help them become self-aware about where they're strong, where they're not so strong, and what to do about those, how to take advantage of their strengths and how to strengthen the areas where they're weaker so that they can perform at a higher level and they can get the company to perform at a higher level. What you bring to the mix is unique. You were a CEO for 25 years. You That's literally right. can walk the talk. And I suspect that your CEO clients immediately sense that. Well, Mike, I, I tell them, look, I've made so many mistakes. I can learn from those and I want to prevent you from making the same mistakes because mistakes in business are really expensive. And um, I can't exactly predict the future, but I can get pretty close sometimes. And I can say, you know, if we continue down this path, here's what's likely to happen. Maybe we should look at a slightly different way of approaching this issue. And here's why I'll share my experience. And the other thing I love doing is now I never reveal who my CEOs are, Mike, but I learn from my CEOs. And so I find myself at least once a week having a conversation with the CEO about what I just learned from someone else. These are recent best practices. And I, I get excited about learning those best practices and sharing them with my other CEOs. You know, in a parallel fashion, one of the biggest benefits that I personally and professionally have gotten from hosting a podcast is the opportunity to spend time with the Glenn Gals of the world, because we're not only recording the podcast, but we've had a conversation prior. I get a chance to know you. I get a chance to know how you help your clients. And I have been richly blessed by that interaction. And you'll probably note as we're talking, I'm writing down as you say things, because it's something that can benefit me. And if it can benefit my clients, then I can pass it along. So that's a great way of saying it. Well, thank you, Mike. And, and, uh, it, 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 it we're, we're here, you and I to share great information, insights, um, to be helpful to anyone who's listening. So I hope, hope people listening are getting, all you need is one nugget of information out of a good podcast and that makes it all worth it. Well, we hope we can get at least that. You know, Glenn, let's talk about the role of a CEO. Sure. We have listeners who may very well be in that role. We have listeners who may aspire to be a CEO. Describe in your experience, what are the things that one might be mindful of. If you're going to be effective as a CEO, what are some of those absolutes? Well, here's, here's, here's the first and most important absolute and probably the hardest thing for anyone in that role to acknowledge and understand, which is if good things happen in the company, the CEO needs to acknowledge themselves and pat themselves on the back. Now, it's really interesting because most CEOs do not do that. They say, oh, we had a great quarter. Now, how are we going to have a better quarter next quarter? And we just go focus on doing that. So it's important to first acknowledge that when good things happen, it's due to the, the, the efforts of the CEO. But here's the flip side. Mm -hmm. The flip side is that if there's anything in the company that's not going the way you want it to go as a CEO, it's your fault. Mm. Now, I hated learning that when I was a CEO, Mike. I, I said, that can't be right. That doesn't make any sense. It's not my fault. Well, when you really start to understand the role of the CEO, if something's not happening the way you want it to, it is your fault. Either that means you hired the wrong people mm. or you enabled 
someone to hire someone that was the wrong person, or you didn't institute cultural values where people understood the right thing to do, or you didn't measure people appropriately, or you didn't take corrective action, but it all comes back to the CEO. And that's both a great thing and a heavy responsibility. Once you understand that, you begin to understand that you need to act differently. You need to be, communicate differently to everybody in the company because you are the center of what is going to happen in that company. And it comes with great responsibility, but it also can be phenomenally rewarding when you see people executing against a shared goal that you've created in a way where everybody's rowing together. A very hard place to get, but it's very fulfilling when you get there. You answered that so beautifully, not knowing I was going to ask that question. Uh, <laughs> we did discuss prior all the things that we could talk about. One of the things that really intrigued me is in your work with CEOs, all CEOs face challenges, many challenges, but I'd like to maybe spend some time kind of digging into uh, some that you see very, very um, often. Um, and the, the one that caught my attention is that you may have a CEO uh, who wants to scale faster. Do you find that wanting to scale faster is one of the biggest challenges that CEOs face? Well, um, yeah, absolutely. It's the scaling that's the challenge. So mm. a, a little side note here. When I was in venture capital, we fired 60% of our CEOs over a five-year period. Goodness. Now, why did we do that? They were great CEOs when we put our money in initially. But scaling a company is one of the biggest challenges, and those CEOs could not scale their company. Now, when you peel the onion, Mike, you understand that the reason is usually because the CEO themselves didn't scale their skills and their knowledge and their ability mm -hmm. to lead. And that's why there's a lot of replacement of CEOs when the desire is to grow. The individual, the CEO themselves has to grow. And growing, well, part of my job is to help the CEO identify the areas where they need to grow and help them grow there. See, often the CEO is in the role because they have certain skills today for the size of the company today, for what the company is doing today. If you, if you desire to scale, in order to move the company through a growth phase, that itself requires different skills. And the CEO doesn't always have them or isn't always as skilled as they would like to be in those areas. So a great coach is gonna help the CEO identify how does that individual scale? How do they grow? And we'll give them tools to grow. We'll give them the ways of thinking, the ways of communicating, the ways of um, operating that will enable the company to scale. And, this, and the, the CEO has to choose to be on board with that. It's, it's a learning process, but it's uncomfortable. Mike, it means that I, as a CEO, have to step into an arena that I haven't been in before. Oh, it's a bigger company. Oh, there are a lot more employees. Oh, there are a lot more challenges. And how do you do that? You want to, you, you need someone, and this is what I like to do is you need someone who's going to nudge you out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to scale. If you're willing to grow and try new things and experiment, you are going to find that you can scale yourself and as a result, scale the company. All right, I'm going to be fully candid with you. I was not expecting that, but that's the perfect response that you should give. I was thinking more pragmatically how to increase sales and production and like, and you're saying it's more fundamental than that. Absolutely. Look, if I want to increase sales, well, what does that mean? Maybe I need a new head of sales mm -hmm. or maybe I need a new approach a different, a different uh, distribution channel or a different way of selling or a different way of positioning or a different way of marketing. And I might not be good at all those things. So if I'm gonna scale, often what happens is we discover in the scaling process that not only do I need to hire great people, but I need to hire leaders who can build teams. Yes. 
So it's not only do I need to hire a great, in your example, a VP of sales, I need to hire a great VP of sales who knows how to build a great sales team. So it's a different way of thinking because I'm building infrastructure with my people. And that in and of itself is often a different thing for the CEO to understand, I'm now going to hire different kinds of people. How do I do that? How do I, how do I identify them? How do I get comfortable, Mike, hiring people that are better than I am mm. at a lot of different things? Because often you're the CEO because at one point you were the smartest person in the room. Yep. And I had to learn as a CEO that I'd rather be surrounded by the smartest people in the room. And that's what helped me be successful. Without a doubt. What have you found as if you've got CEOs as a client and they conclude, I've got people on this team that I have, but gosh, there's one who's really tough to manage. Is that something you see in your role as a CEO coach? Most CEOs have somewhere between six and eight people reporting to them, Mike. Okay. I can guarantee that at least one and often two of those people are not a good fit. Hmm. Just based on the patterns I see. And in fact, if as a CEO, you force rank those eight people reporting to you, they're going to be two people at the bottom just by nature of force ranking. So this, it is one of the most common things I see. So the question becomes, as a CEO, what am I going to do about those bottom two people? And there's a very important question you want to ask first and foremost is, let's just use the example of the bottom person. The first, the first question is, is this person a keeper? And what I mean by that is, am I going to let them go or not? Hmm. Okay. Now, very often when they're at the bottom of that rank, you should let them go. Okay, we tend to hold on to people that are at the bottom for a variety of reasons. And we tend to know that it's not going to work out, but we hang on to them. And it's one of the biggest mistakes the CEOs make is not making a quick transition when something's not working out. But let's assume that person is a keeper. We've decided they just need help. So the question now is, if that person's a keeper, we're talking about the one at the bottom of the list. What kind of investment are we going to make? in helping that person. And the investment is often the time of the CEO. Mm. And so now you have a different kind of relationship with that person at the bottom. You as the CEO have decided they're a keeper, that they're gonna grow into this role. And I, the CEO, am gonna help them do that. I might bring in some external help, that's fine, but I also need to spend time with them. I'm investing time in them because I've determined it's worth it. And it's a conscious decision to assist that individual in becoming better at whatever it is they need to be better at to be more effective and perform at a higher level. That's one of the key things here about the CEO is that the, the CEO's role is to enable and help the leadership team to perform at their highest level. Mm -hmm. All about leverage once you build a leadership team. I hope I answered the question. You answered it very well. I'd love to go back just for a moment to your venture capital days. Sure. I, I don't know if I got the statistic committed to memory, but I thought you said something to the effect to 50 to 60% of the CEOs don't make it over a five-year time period. Is that close right. to what you said? That's right. Yeah. And I've overly simplified said is in part because I didn't the organizations they were leading did not perform, but I read into it is that a large contributing factor is that you were looking for growing the company and they may not have been able or not willing to grow themselves or grow their leadership team. Am I connecting dots that I shouldn't be? No, you no, you're you're absolutely right. So um uh, uh when you have a startup founder, um they started up the company because they have a vision mm -hmm. and they have certain skills. It's often an engineering skill or they understand the market or they're great at the product or they're great at selling, but it's usually a single function skill. They're particularly good at maybe two functions. Then as the company needs to grow the next phase mm -hmm. of growth, now you start to build a team. All of a sudden you, you require a new skill set, which is 
hiring talented people, which turns out to be the most important job of the CEO, by the way. What if you're great at engineering, but you're not great at hiring talented people in other functions? Mm -hmm. Well, as a CEO, that's first area of growth. You need to grow into hiring a great team. How do you do that? Well, a coach can help you understand the process you need to go through to develop those skills. Then let's say you become good at that and you hire a great team. Now you need a new skill, managing a leadership team. Hmm. hmm. I used to write code. That's why I started this company. Now I have to manage a leadership team. I haven't done that before. You need a new set of skills. Okay. Yes. Then you move to the next phase of growth. Maybe the next phase of growth has to do with raising capital. Well, um, now I have to talk to a whole new set of individuals in the world, investors. I have to tell a different story. I have to convince them to give us money. And maybe I'm just going to go to the banks, but I still have to treat them in a different way. I have a new skill set. I'm, I'm not communicating just to customers or to the engineering team or to the sales team. I have constituencies I need to uh, communicate with effectively and sell to. Well, maybe I didn't have those skills in the past, but I need them now because I'm the CEO and no one's going to look to anybody else if they're going to give us money, whether it's debt or equity uh, or capital. Um, I, I, I need to communicate differently. I need a new set of skills. And then you're going to move on to the next phase, which requires another set of skills. And, and that's why you see high turnover in CEOs. And yet the successful CEOs are learning machines. They're hungry. And they recognize that even if I'm not comfortable with this next phase of growth, I'm going to figure it out and they get the help they need to do that. Mm. You know, thus far we were talking about the challenges, some of the biggest challenges that CEOs face. We've talked about the scalability and you've clarified how, what that term scale faster means. And we've talked about some of the challenges is when you inevitably have one or more people on that team, you have to make a decision. What might be some additional challenges that you see very often in your work with CEOs? Well, one that I see very often is what I'll call the massive responsibilities of the CEO. Mm. The CEO uniquely sees everything in the company. They don't own just one function. They own everything. And they're often very ambitious. That's how you got to be a CEO. You're very ambitious and you want to get a lot done. So the dilemma is you may have 17 things on your to-do list, things that are important to you that you really want to get done. So one of the hardest things I learned was when I had 17 things on my to-do list, my coach helped me cross off 14 of those things. Mm -hmm. Man, that was painful. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to cross off any of those things. But I recognize that focus was my friend, that if I could focus on the three most important things in a certain time frame, usually 90 days, if I could focus the whole company around the three most important things over the next 90 days, we were going to get those things done. See, what tends to happen, Mike, is if I have 17 things on my list and you have a bunch of things on your list and three other people have a bunch of things on their list, we're going to get some stuff done but we're not going to achieve our goals because we're trying to do too much. But if as a CEO, I can narrow my personal focus and the focus of the company down to a small number of areas of focus for each individual, magic can happen. Because we're, what we're really doing is we're choosing to not do a lot of things. That's a very difficult challenge for a CEO. Yes, we, that looks important, but we're not going to do it. We're going to choose to not do it. We're going to put it off to the side for now and just focus on those things that we deem are the most important things to focus on. Very, very effective way of managing a company to help it grow. So you just kind of walked the listeners through if the CEO had 17 things on his or her list, you helped them mark 14 off at least temporarily but you said something that was interesting, and that is if focus is going to be your friend, you mentioned that that focus has to be of a certain duration. It can't go on indefinitely. You said That's 90 right. days. Is that a kind of default? Do you find that a 90-day 
time horizon to be focusing on specific things. Does that work best for I, CEOs? I, yeah, I find it, uh, well, there's contextually, uh, I'm going to use kind of a funnel approach. Contextually, it's important to understand a vision for the company, and that's three to five years out. And then strategically, you might say, here are certain objectives we want to cover over the next year or so, but they're very high level. Mm -hmm. Like grow the company could be an objective or become a great place to work could be an objective, right? But then what happens is that needs to translate into what do I actually, what do, what do I, let's say I'm on the, uh, the leadership team, if I have a, a particular role, what do I need to actually get done in a short period of time? And I've found that 90 days is a magical time because you actually take a couple of weeks to figure out what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out, okay, I'm going to choose something that's measurable to get done in the next 90 days. Let's say we're in marketing and we need to create X number of leads, okay? And we, we have a, we've chosen a 90-day period to achieve those X number of leads, right? Just as an example. Well, now, if the CEO is managing the head of marketing, we can look every single week at how are we doing against that goal? It's pretty easy to measure the progress against that goal. Now, the beauty of that is if the CEO is sitting down with one of his, uh, his or her direct reports every week about the key goal they're going after, a couple of things happen. One is that direct report, first of all, understands, you know what? The CEO really cares about this goal because they're asking me every single week about it. Mm -hmm. They're serious about this. That's one thing that happens. The next is we can figure out very quickly, are we on target or not? If we're on target, well, we don't have to talk a lot about what we need to do with that. But most of the time, we'll start to see slippage. That's just natural. We'll see slippage. And then the question is, what are we going to do about that? Mm -hmm. And so we can, again, this is another area of focus. Oh, one of our key uh, results that we're looking for in the next 90 days looks like it's going to be hard to do. We, we need to do something different. And we change as a result of that. And that's why the 90 days is so valuable because there's a lot of work to get that key result completed by the end of the 90 days. And then all of a sudden we'll be in a strategy session asking ourselves, what do we want to do over the next 90 days? And maybe it's a bigger number against mm -hmm. that one target, or maybe it's something else that we've learned that we need to, to do differently. But if, we're, if, if, we, if we take the beginning of the 90 day period and we do a strategy session to figure out what's important, then we just move into execution mode. Mm -hmm. And that's what the 90 days is all about. If we can just execute and not be distracted by everything else against those most important things, we can make magic happen. As you reflect back, Glenn, on your experience as a CEO or in venture capital or as the CEO therapist, can you share an example where either you or a client or somebody in your organization just got stuck? And when that happened, what did it take to get unstuck? Sure, um, it, uh, getting getting stuck happens all the time, um, and 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 the getting stuck is often a question of what is it about? Well, I'll I'll use I'll use a, a, a special phrase here. Um, let's say you're running um, the manufacturing floor, and mm -hmm. it's not producing. Or, or, or one of your direct reports is, right? You're the CEO and you're running the manufacturing floor and, and, and it's just not producing what we need it to produce. And you figure out it might have to do with some of the people. Because mm -hmm. usually, little secret here, it has to do with the people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. Um, so the question for the CEO that they often don't ask themselves, and this is where they get stuck, is it is, Mike, I'm going to pretend you're the CEO, okay? I'm okay. going to say, Mike, what is it about your behavior that's enabling that behavior that isn't allowing us to produce at the level we want to produce? Because um, if, if I were your coach, I would ask you that question, and you wouldn't like that question at all, right? Because I'm for me now. <laughs> I'm, putting it, I'm, putting it, I'm putting it on you, okay? But that's where they get stuck. CEOs get stuck is, you mean it's my behavior? that's enabling some other behavior. Let's just use a simple example. We're running too much overtime and therefore our, our, our total costs are rising. 
and that's causing our margins to decline. Mm -hmm. And that's our problem. So my question to you, Mike, would be if you're running that company, what is it about your behavior that's enabling that overtime to happen? And then you'd have to scratch your head and ask yourself, what, what are you doing? Maybe you're pushing the team to perform uh, at a higher level, ir irrespective of cost, and, and you're, you're not measuring them on cost. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you need to go into overtime right now because there's a particular strategic account that you need to fulfill and you're okay with that. Well, then maybe that's okay, but you haven't told people that's okay. So you want to go back. That This is where people get stuck is what is it that I personally as a CEO can do differently to cause behavior change? It's all about behavior change. That's what we're looking for as a CEO. For people to perform at a higher level, they individually, as your leadership team, need to change their behavior in some way. And this is hard for people to do. Humans don't <laughs> ask themselves, how can I change my behavior today? But the role of the CEO is to identify what kind of behavior change is necessary and to help those individuals change their behavior. I don't think I've heard it described that way, but if you want a certain outcome and it requires a change in behavior, if you're the CEO, it starts with your willingness to change your own behavior if you want to see a change in the person's behavior that will result in the outcome. Exactly right. So uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I heard Sheryl Sandberg speak. She's not the CEO, but the COO of what was called Facebook. Um, and, and, and her team wasn't doing what she wanted them to do. And so she brought her team in and she was, she was upset. Mm -hmm. She was upset because it was important and they weren't doing what she wanted them to do. And she said to them, you all are not doing what I want you to do. And then she said this magic phrase, and that's on me. Mm. When you hear a leader get up in front of a group and say, and that's on me. That's, 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 that's amazing. It's rare. What happened? So, so many things happen in that moment is that the team who was being chastised now realizes the leaders taking the responsibility, which the leader needs to do. Leader always mm -hmm. needs to take responsibility, but it also means that now everybody's listening. No one's defensive anymore, making excuses for why they're not doing what they should be doing. They're now listening. This leader just took responsibility for that. I love this leader is what people mm -hmm. start to think, right? I'm going to listen to what comes out of her mouth next. And she's going to tell us what to do differently. She created an environment where people could listen. Right? So as a leader, as a CEO, you need to create an environment where people will listen. Because one of the frustrations of any CEO is they want things to happen in a certain way and they don't. When they don't happen in a certain way, even though they thought they were perfectly clear in communicating that, it's extraordinarily frustrating. So the CEO needs to come back and ask themselves, what is it about my behavior that's enabling that behavior? Very powerful question. And that's a great illustration. Thank you for sharing that. You know, Glenn, as you kind of reflect on what we've discussed today, there may be some things you would like to add but there may be some things you want to make sure that our listeners have as takeaways. What might that be? The role of the CEO can be extremely rewarding. Mm -hmm. And the nature of a person who is the CEO is that they need to, I mentioned this earlier, they need to acknowledge their wins. So I've had CEOs who had their best quarter ever step into the planning for next quarter depressed. Hmm. Depressed because even though it was the best quarter ever, Mike, it wasn't good enough. Hmm. And so they step into the planning depressed about what just happened, even though they broke company records. Now, the reason I'm not just saying this from a happiness standpoint, I'm talking about this from a motivational and performance standpoint. If you as a CEO don't acknowledge yourself, you're probably not acknowledging your team. Yes. And everybody understands you're depressed. You can't hide that. Mm -hmm. Your mental state is clear to everybody you're working with. And if you step into a quarterly planning session depressed, 
everybody's going to be depressed and worried and concerned. Should I even be working at this company? Are we on the right path? But if you step into that quarterly planning session, even if it, that last quarter wasn't exactly what you wanted, but by the way, you set records, you're going to acknowledge everybody on your team who did a great job. You're going to do that publicly. You're going to acknowledge yourself because you deserve to take responsibility for making that happen. And you're going to step into the planning session motivate with, with a team who's motivated, who wants to follow you. So your mental state, this is why sometimes my clients call me the CEO therapist. Your mental state enables you to perform at a higher level. And that means your team will perform at a higher level when you're representing yourself that way as a motivated, excited, uh, positive, optimistic leader. Glenn, I've had the opportunity to spend some time on your website and see the number of valuable resources that you make available to people who visit your website. But I'm also confident that people listening want to know more about you. What's the best way for them to connect with you online? The easiest way is simply uh, like you did, Mike, go to my website, which is my name, glengow.com. That's Glenn with two N's, G-O-W.com. Glenn with two N's, G-O-W.com. Uh, we will obviously list that in the show notes. Uh, Glenn, I did sit here. I took my eyes off you as I was making good notes, literal notes. This has been most helpful to me. I'm confident it's been, going, been very helpful to our listeners. Thank you for sharing that expertise. Mike, it's such a pleasure. I enjoy spending time with you, and I hope your listeners got at least one nugget out of our conversation. There's no question I'm confident they have. Let me also say thank you to the listeners as well for giving us time today. We upload the latest episodes to Apple, Google, and Spotify every Thursday. So if you've enjoyed this episode with Glenn, please subscribe. Is your company growing quickly? We've talked about that. Are you worried that you don't have the right people and processes in place to handle the increased workload? Or maybe you're not sure that you have the right planning systems to assure success. If yes, let's talk. Head to bench-builders.com to schedule a quick call. We'll explore ways to help you solve those nagging problems so you can scale faster and smarter. Now we've all learned from Glenn today on how that starts with the CEO, but I wanna thank you for joining us, the listeners, and I hope you have picked up on more than one tip from Glenn that will help you get unstuck and on target. Until next time.